Chuck Linick, I'm a reenactor. And for 36 years in the classroom, I reenacted history in order to bring the subject to life. And I did that with wearing garb from different time periods, getting a lot of weird looks from students and adults, and bringing in enough realia and artifacts to make it seem like I was bringing in a small museum that was portable, and try to breathe life into the subject. Well, I've got time on my hands, I've got a room at my house that is filled to capacity with garb, which is not at all from this century, and I have a passion for bringing the past to life, and a desire to preserve landmarks. So I started what I very pretentiously call my Mission Odyssey, where I am visiting in Alta, California, each of the missions, assistencias, those are the spin-off missions that are intended to grow up in full-size missions. The estancias that I can find, those are the ranch stations designed to grow food and support the missions. And the presidios, those are the fortifications to protect the missions and all those other places. And I've been finding a few other historical spots. So my mission today, I'm traveling up the El Camino Real. Currently I'm on the 101 freeway. And I have traveled the 60 miles from Mission San Fernando, Rey de España. And I'm on my way to Mission San Buenaventura the site of a controversy uh, this past summer of a Father Sarah statue that was in front of City Hall and which eventually got removed and moved over to the mission. And as I'm filming this, we also have the pandemic going on, so that's adding a few wrinkles to my uh, journey. But I hope you stick with me. original inhabitants of the area were the Chumash and these were a matrilineal people they um, were hunter-gatherers uh, those that lived near the coast tended to have a lot of seafood in their diet although they were also you know hunting mainland animals um, they were building canoes out of redwood and navigating the ocean between the mainland and the Channel Islands, conducting extensive trade there. Well, the Spanish are going to show up and they're going to redesignate them Venterenos and they'll be putting the Venterenos to work you know, for the mission. Before the Chumash got renamed to suit the Spaniards and uh, associating the groups of Chumash with the various missions, they did have encounters with the Spanish. Um, in 1542, 50 years after Columbus showed up, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo uh, sailed north from Mexico and what Cabrillo had done he was one of the people who he was associated with Cortez he uh, really profited from the encomienda system um, he made an insane amount of money in Guatemala uh, in Honduras he did what was very typical of the encomienda system as far as you know, sending men to work in the mines and uh, 
distributing the women amongst his men. You're supposed to be very analytical and very even-handed when looking at history. And it's kind of hard for me to do this right now because I'm talking about conquistadors. I'm talking about people who would end up obliterating other cultures. And while you are not supposed to judge people and their actions based upon your standards and your time period, it's difficult not to. And this is going to get a little creepier. So, you know, Cabrillo was issued orders to go explore the Pacific coast, go north. And he took three ships with him. And as he sailed about, he discovered, you know, San Diego Bay. Six days later, he's in the vicinity of what's going to be the site of Mission San Buenaventura. And he was describing the Chumash about how friendly they were. And he was furiously writing notes and the Padre that was with him on his expedition was writing notes and various landmarks were being named. Of course, they're being given Spanish names. And he sailed as far north as the Russian River. Didn't notice San Francisco Bay on the way up. Got driven back by storms. Didn't notice San Francisco Bay on the way back, which probably leads to the idea that there was fog hiding it. And he was exploring the islands, and on one of the islands, his crew got into a fight with the natives, right, native Californios. And while trying to help his men, he was scrambling over some rocks, broke his leg, got gangrene, died. He was buried on, some accounts say the island of San Miguel, some accounts say Catalina. I tend to lean towards San Miguel. So, end of his story, except that now there's a diary which describes his adventures and describes various landmarks. Sixty years after Cabrillo explores um, the uh, Pacific coast and then is buried on one of the islands, I still say San Miguel, another explorer, Sebastian Vizcaino, is sent forth. He's sent on the same mission and he is of course having people to keep records for him and as he's sailing uh, up the coast he is naming landmarks oddly enough he's renaming them you know because a lot of these were ones that Cabrillo had seen and he was remarking also on how friendly the Chumash were and this kind of creeped me out because you realize that these are people who profited from the in the system, they profited from what they did in subjugating these other cultures. And here they are looking at these various natives as, oh, look how friendly they are. And that really got to me. Well, when he came back with his uh, discovery of uh, the Bay at Monterey, this led to a whole bunch of excitement, and there was talk of establishing a post up there and that doesn't happen for like 170 years. In 1769, this is more than a century and a half after uh, Vizcaino's visit, the Portola expedition came through and both Portola and Father Crespi were frantically writing in their diaries about how friendly the Chumash were. And this was also something that uh, Father Sarah noted, and this is why he really wanted to establish 
a mission in this area. What also really disturbed me is a foreshadowing. You know, because if you read enough history, you notice this stuff of uh, talking about how friendly the Chumash were and how complex their culture seemed to be and they were noting the petroglyphs and just all sorts of things that the Chumash were doing like building their tomos, their uh, redwood plank canoes and sailing to the islands and you have to understand with the missions they're pretty much going to wipe out cultures. They're going to alter the cultures beyond recognition. So for Father Sarah to note how fascinated he was really bothers me because I don't see where any of the Chumash culture would be something that the Spanish would want to preserve. In March of 1782, a party of eight soldados de Cuera, their families, um, a number of men uh, driving the mules, left Mission San Gabriel. And on March 31st, Easter Sunday, they arrived. Uh, Father Sarah had a cross erected. It was actually on the beach itself. But, so this is not the original cross, this has been replaced a number of times, but it was moved up to the hill to basically serve as like a landmark you know, for travelers. When the Spanish decided to build their mission, they didn't actually build the mission first. They built a chapel that they named for San Miguel. And they did it basically about 0.2 miles away from the site of Mission San Buenaventura. Uh, this was an area that was used by the Chumash to celebrate harvest. And so the dates are kind of confusing on this. While the mission was being constructed in 1782, San Miguel Chapel was being built. Um, apparently the name came from the fact that the Chumash would celebrate a harvest around the time, it just happened to coincide on the Spanish Catholic calendar uh, for San Miguel, so instead of naming this San Buenaventura, which so many missions had so many different sites where they would start in one place and then there would be some sort of disaster like a fire um, or a flood, and then they'd build another, and then they'd build another and keep the name going. So that had me puzzled for a while, but okay, that makes sense. You know, we built you know, San Miguel here, San Buenaventura is up that way. Oh, and behind me is the Camino Real and the 101 freeway, which is being very noisy this morning. There is a bit of confusion on the dates because, well, I saw a date for the construction of the San Miguel Chapel in 1782. I saw another date for 1819, which really didn't make a lot of sense to me. first actual San Buenaventura Chapel was dedicated, I believe, September 10th of 1782, and like many of the uh, early missions, it burned down. So a second one was built. Behind me, there's the remains of the second one. Let me show you a better image of that. 
the stones mark out the outline of the mission itself. You see that wood that's in there? That actually was the uh, where the door was. The thing is, this mission didn't last very long at all, and the uh, Padres moved on to building the third mission. However, see this building right here? That's Holy Cross School, and that was built on top of the Chumash Cemetery that was here. So now we come to the third attempt at Mission San Buenaventura, which didn't actually get dedicated until 1809. But this is a the one that's standing here right now, that uh, is a rebuilt version and it's pretty much modeled on uh, what the third version of the mission was supposed to look like. A three-tiered campanario has five bells that were originally borrowed from Mission Santa Barbara. What's different about this is Mission San Buenaventura has two wooden bells. They're made of wood with a metal band inside for the clapper to strike. They were used during Holy Week between Palm Sunday and Easter while the metal bells were silent. I have no idea why. They're not only unique to this mission. There's a single wooden bell hanging in La Purisima where originally there was a metal bell, but they're the only full-sized wooden bells in the world. So this third church was begun in 1792, along with some of the buildings that were going to form the quadrangle later. It was half finished by about 1795, but not completed until 1809. And I have to correct myself, this is the only building from the original mission that's still standing in spite of earthquakes and even a tidal wave. At about this same time as the chapel is being completed, 1809, the mission is proving to be very productive agriculturally and was able to also have a couple of assistencias, one at Santa Gertrudis, about six or seven miles away, and the other at Santa Paula, about 18, 19 miles away, up the Santa Clara River. I have to come back. That's because I talk too much. Actually, I have too much stuff. So, I hope you'll stick with me.